from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Bringing issues to the forefront. We like to fix problems. And uh, that's a good thing and it's a necessary part of being a successful farmer. But uh, oftentimes we, we don't take the time to fix our own problems. Now a new program is helping farmers and their families cope. Farmers are just weeks away from starting to plant. A look at what could change the acreage mix this year. As the effort to stop Mexico's ban on imports of U.S. GMO corn moves to a new level, right now on Anchor. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. U.S. officials are trying to take the next step in resolving Mexico's planned ban of U.S. GMO corn. Now, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office announcing it's calling for technical consultations with Mexico about the issue. It says the consultations fall under the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Measures chapter of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Now, in a news release, it said the intention through this process is to reach an outcome that respects each country's sovereignty and benefits the U.S., Mexico, as well as ag producers and stakeholders. Ambassador Catherine Tai saying that Mexico's policies threaten to disrupt billions of dollars in ag trade and will stifle innovation necessary to tackle climate issues and food security if left unaddressed. Now, the U.S. Grains Council and American Soybean Association both agreeing with the announcement. I mean, obviously, this is a trade agreement that was negotiated uh, with the with Mexico and Canada, and so it does have the the full effect of a trade agreement. Um, and we expect our trading partners to live up to that. At the end of last month, U.S. Trade Representative Special Agriculture Negotiator Doug McCallop noted that Mexico was granting approvals to applications for new genetically modified plant traits and said Mexico appeared interested in finding a solution. Ag Day at Ag Industry Days is brought to you by The Mosaic Company, creating innovative advanced crop nutrition products and practices. Farmers are taking a close look at prices and input costs ahead of this planting season. Well, Michelle Rook recently spoke to growers and analysts at this year's CHS Ag Industry Days in Grand Forks, North Dakota about the acreage mix this spring. Clint, as you can see, farmers here in the northwestern Corn Belt have had normal to above normal precip this winter, which will play into planting intentions, but so will commodity prices and input costs. Commodity prices are still historically strong to start 2023, but the big difference this spring is input prices like fertilizer have dropped, which will influence acreage decisions. And I was able also last year to buy my fertilizer when it kind of took that downturn in February. Um, right now, I did put some fertilizer on last fall because we were trying to take, try to get a few steps ahead for 2023. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been nice to see a little bit of a little step back from some of those input prices. Supply chain issues are easing and so the availability of inputs including crop protection products is also better than the last two seasons. I would say availability looks better than it did last year. Um, there's, there's some things that have gone up in price coming into this year and there's some reductions. You know the glufosinates, glyphosates are, are down compared to a year ago but there's some other there's some other um, basic manufacturer stuff that's, you know, probably a 5% increase. So with all this in mind, what do market experts think the acreage mix will look like in the northwestern Corn Belt? You know, I think we're going to see more corn acres, especially in the southeast part of the state. I mean, last year was a good indication that corn can make it through just about anything. So I think we will see an increase. I think prevent plants will be a little bit lower this year. That'll help with some of the increase in acreage. Spring wheat, I think, is going to lose of some acreage. I don't see the incentive to plant wheat, especially with the losses that we've seen as of late. And I think bean acres will see a little bit of an increase. So when you talk about North Dakota, you got to talk about Ukraine also, because a lot of the oil seeds that could be grown in Ukraine can also be grown in North Dakota. And so sunflower, sunflower, oil, canola, uh, we have these uh, new plants that are supposedly opening up. The, this market's on fire for oil seeds and we're gonna need every acre we can up here. Planting intentions are also influenced by February crop insurance guarantees with lower prices for soybeans and spring wheat versus a year ago. Plus, with the diversity of crops that can be planted, especially in North Dakota, it makes for an intense acreage battle this spring. But Mother Nature will still have the final say. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day.
All right, thanks, Michelle. The American Farm Bureau Federation says last year will go down as the third costliest year when it comes to weather disasters. It puts a total economic hit at $165 billion. It says it adds up to more than $21 billion in crop losses. AFBF economists looked at weather events, including hurricanes Fiona and Ian, along with a June derecho that impacted the central U.S. and the ongoing drought out in the West. Now, a group of senators sending a letter to Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack last week, they're voicing deep concerns about phase two of the Emergency Relief Program, or ERP2. That's the ad hoc program that distributes disaster aid for losses from weather events like drought. The legislators saying the process is extremely complicated as it requires farmers to share personal tax records. And they say that information doesn't necessarily correlate to crop losses by crop year, which makes phase two less precise. Now, the National Association of Wheat Growers telling us last week phase two of the program won't cover losses caused by last year's drought. But NOG's CEO says that Vilsack addressed the issue during a recent grower meeting. By the time we divide that all up, those payments are not going to be sufficient enough to cover all the loss. He was very upfront with me. He spoke to my board of directors immediately after that, saying the same thing. So we are concerned. The department is very much aware of the lack of allocation that they have for that. But I know that they will continue to work on behalf of our growers that are suffering through uh, climate and weather issues that are beyond their control. Now, under phase two, the maximum payment a grower can receive is $2,000. Part of the Golden State are blanketed under monster amounts of snow after back-to-back -back winter storms blasted mountain towns in Southern California. Now, some residents report they've been snowed in at their homes for more than a week. They say they're running low on food and other necessities. We're still snowed in. Uh, we're having to snowshoe out of, our, uh, out of our road here to get groceries, to get supplies, and to check on our neighbors. There's a lot of uh, you know, elderly and disabled people in the area that need help as well. And we're doing what we can to check on them. Some areas have seen more than 30 inches of snowfall just in a 24 hour period. And that snow persists in the West. Meteorologist Andrew Whitmire joins us with more. We are going to be tracking that atmospheric river. We'll talk more about that in Maine weather. But for now, let's go ahead and take a look at the severe weather threat that'll be happening today and Wednesday down across parts of Texas, Oklahoma. I can even see this being expanded a little bit further off towards the east over towards a Little Rock as well. The main threats here are going to be damaging wind, heavy rain and small hail. A very slim chance there of a few isolated tornadoes. Let's walk you through the, uh, the uh, future radar here as we go throughout this Tuesday. Uh, we'll be watching a, a dry front uh, working its way through the southern plains. That'll help spark a few of those scattered showers and thunderstorms. And then again, notice how they go over towards Little Rock and Memphis. I think we'll see at least a chance of a few stronger storms across the uh, Memphis area as we head on into Wednesday. And then there's a northern side of the system. We're watching more snow showers. And in fact, uh, some shovelable amounts of snow once again for parts of the northern prairie. They don't really need more snow, but this is what Mother Nature has on the menu here. It could be looking at another half foot of snow. Combine that with wind, they'll be looking at some white out conditions. And it's just California getting hit with a lot of snow. Jim Espy of Wyoming sharing this photo. He said once again, the donut hole is closed, adding that winter wouldn't bother him so much if it wasn't six months long. But it feels that way, Jim. But he said the good thing is no mosquitoes. I'll more in your Ag Day forecast in just a few. With inflation and interest rates still rising, what does that mean for farmers going forward? We head back to North Dakota coming up in analysis. And later, helping the whole farm family cope through trying times in the country. With inflation continuing to run hot, these higher interest rates are likely here to stay for a little while. Michelle Rook takes a look at what that means for farmers once again from the CHS Ag Industry Days in North Dakota. Joining us with this morning's market analysis, Tommy Grisafi with Advanced Trading. And Tommy, let's talk about short and long-term interest rates. They are on the rise, aren't they? Yeah, farmers are really starting to notice that. And I don't think they're really familiar with talking about the yield curve, but they very much notice that you can get four and a half, five percent in a three and six month CD, yet the 10 year just crossed four percent. And so we have an inverted yield curve, which usually gives a sign that there's a recession, but for farming, in my opinion, it's a great opportunity. You're either paying interest or earning interest in something we haven't talked about in a long time. It's been 15 years since we've had a conversation about selling grain and putting that money and getting 5% versus 
watching what happened where grain goes down 50 cents and losing that money. So it's very serious right now, the cost of money. So if you have to borrow money for operating, obviously there's a little sticker shock there, isn't there? Yeah, so right down the street, I, I, my office is at First State Bank in Mayville, North Dakota, and uh, a lot of farmers aren't necessarily borrowing a lot of money right now because they're cash strong, but if they had to borrow money, it's a big price, seven, eight, nine percent on operating, big difference from where we were three, three and a half, four percent just a year ago. So what's your advice to producers right now then? Well, the market was given a big signal to sell grain. If you store your grain, it looks like it would be 12, 14 cents lower, but yet the farmer's so hopeful and optimistic that grain would be higher. So we, the same philosophy, nothing's changed now except for the market drop. If you are selling grain, we wanna own a call, call spread, probably go to that July uh, level. Obviously the best time to sell, every farmer wants what they could have had a month ago, a week ago. I'm not so sure we'll go back to those prices right away. No, but is the bottom in in the grains, do you think? I think we could have a, a wild spring and summer. We still have a lot of weather. Just around here, there's four foot uh, piles of snow. It's gonna be a long time till the snow melts. One optimistic thing is that a lot of moisture has hit the Midwest and we needed that. So if it does, if spring does come and the heat comes, we'll get that crop in. All right, Tommy Grisafi joining us with Advanced Trading. We're here at the CHS Ag Services Ag Industry Day in Grand Forks. On the road here with Ag Day, I'm Michelle Rook. Interested in spending a day with a trader? Call Tommy Grisafi at 800-664-4383. Get in the game and be part of the 2023 Bracket Busters Challenge presented by Case IH. It's farmer versus farmer for a chance to win the $1,000 top prize. Go to agweb.com to fill out your bracket once teams are selected on Sunday, March 12th. Meteorologist Andrew Whitmire joining us here taking a look at our national forecast. And we're going to start back out west where they've seen a ton of snow, but looks like more moisture on the way. Yeah, unfortunately, this is something that we talked uh, briefly about in crop comments here, but we're watching another atmospheric river that's going to set up likely late this week and could persist for another week, bringing with it several systems here up along the Pacific Northwest as well as the uh, California coastline. And this is going to bring another round of heavy moisture in the form of rain and in the Intermountain Rust and Sierra Mountains, we're going to have to watch for heavy pockets of snow as well. And let's investigate this atmospheric river by turning on over to the jet stream here as we go throughout the week to look for signs there out on the western coast there to see why we're going to anticipate more of this atmospheric river coming back into play here for the western half here of the U.S. And as we walk you through the jet stream throughout the first half of this week, notice how we start to get this uh, trough building off to our west. That'll come into play here. And we're going to be again allowing several waves of energy to approach the western coast here. And we're looking at uh, several inches of water out west and in the Intermountain West and especially the uh, Sierra Nevada. Uh, we're going to be watching potential here for uh, more snowfall. In fact, it could be looking at several feet of snow for some of those extreme higher elevations. Then as we head forward into this weekend, we'll be watching some more uh, troughing going on up around the uh, Great Lakes area and around the New England uh, states, and that'll trend a cooler pattern that will begin for this upcoming weekend. Walking through the water forecast here as we again look out towards the west throughout the end of this week is when we're expecting more waves of water to approach the western uh, coast there. And again, it will be inundated by several inches of water. And we have to watch the mountain ranges there where we could be looking at feet of snow as we head towards the end of this week. Walking through the future radar here, we'll be watching a few scattered systems moving through the midsection of the country, but all eyes on several systems that will be working their way through the Pacific Northwest. Notice that nice swirl there. That'll bring with it some heavy moisture chances again, and there you go by Friday, seeing some of the atmospheric river starting to pick up moisture out west. Temperatures for this afternoon, Check out parts of Texas hanging out into the 80s, 43 in Chicago, 54 St. Louis, and 41 over into Denver. Cooler air up to the north in Bismarck will begin to filter down across parts of the lower 48 here by next weekend. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look here at Ag Day Select Cities. Going over to Liberty, Pennsylvania, clouds and breezy, high 35, low 22. Going over to Wichita Falls, we'll have to watch out for a few scattered strong storms developing late in the day and overnight. High 78 degrees and going over to Eagle, Idaho, few snow showers possible. Closed captioning on Ag Day is brought to you by BASF, helping you do the biggest job on earth.
For the first time this year, a dairy margin coverage payment will be issued. The Farm Service Agency announcing the February DMC income over feed cost calculation is $7.94 per hundredweight. So, milk covered at the $9.50 level will see an indemnity of $1.56. Now, each 1 million pounds insured at that $9.50 level will be paid $1,237.09 before sequestration. Now, this month's payment almost covers the annual premium. Dairy market experts say while feed prices are off their highs, they've not moved down as much as milk prices. The FDA has issued draft guidance that would allow nut, oat, soy, and other non-dairy products to use the name milk. But a bipartisan group of senators is trying to take on the issue legislatively. Republican Senators Jim Risch of Idaho, Susan Collins of Maine, and Democratic Senators Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin and Peter Welch of Vermont are reintroducing the Dairy Pride Act. It would require non-dairy products made from nuts, seeds, plants, and algae to no longer be labeled with dairy terms, such as milk, yogurt, or cheese. The National Milk Producers Federation supporting this legislation, saying it's needed more than ever. The Dairy Pride Act is expected to be introduced in the House of Representatives within weeks. Protecting the farm for the future is about more than financials. Why farmers also need to protect themselves mentally in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by Lamar's Toy Store, the largest and most diversified farm toy store in the U.S. They have new and old and do restorations and customizations too. You need to see it to believe it. Visit LamarsToyStore.com or call us at 712-546-4305. In the Country on Ag Day is brought to you by Pivot Bio. What if you had the nitrogen you need already on seed? Pivot Bio is the first company to apply nitrogen on seed. The nitrogen you need, now on seed from Pivot Bio. Learn more at pivotbio.com. Farmers may face many hardships and financial concerns, and that can negatively impact their mental and physical well being. The United of Tennessee Extension offers its Farm Family Health and Wellness Program to help producers deal with issues that some may be reluctant to openly discuss. Charles Denny has more. Farming can be a stressful way to earn a living. Producers must take financial risk, work long hours, and much of their livelihood is dependent on things out of their control, like the weather. Farmers have a high suicide rate and face many pressures in their work and daily lives. Farmers don't have any days off. They are constantly working. Um, they don't get vacations. Um, whether it's rain, shine, or snow, they're out there on their farms early in the morning to late at night um, working. Janet Fox is one of the leaders for UT Extension's Farm Family Health and Wellness Program. It's a Zoom-based webinar anyone can privately join that provides tools to cope with the challenges facing producers. Being a farmer most of my life and the farmers that I encounter, uh, we're fixers. We like to fix problems. And uh, that's a good thing and it's a necessary part of being a successful farmer. But uh, oftentimes we, we don't take the time to fix our own problems. Here Extension partners with TDA, and the first session included a word from Commissioner Charlie Hatcher, who encourages farmers to seek this program if they need it. The University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture's uh, new program for, for farm family health and wellness is a, is a course I think every farmer should attend to, to understand the tools and resources that are available to them to address this issue head on. Other topics talked about here, safety, estate planning, and medical conditions that can come about from life on the farm. But again, all these issues tie in to stress, and that's the core issue addressed by this program. What every operation has is a human. Every, there has to be a person working um, that, that commodity, that land, that operation. And in order for individuals to be their best selves, and again, to be safe, to be the most productive, innovative problem solvers, they have to be able to manage their stress, their overall health. A tough topic to bring up, but a discussion that needs to happen, the mental well-being of our farm families. Producers should know they have our support 
and there's help available, and now might be the time to talk about it. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks Charles, and that's all the time we have this morning. I'm sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.